The glittering, teeming stage of London's West End has always been the lair of monsters. Murderers, rapists and robbers have hidden themselves away in its crowds and alleyways. Attracted by the endless procession of young, innocent prey thronging the streets. In the early summer of 1985, the rarest of all criminal phenomena took place. A ruthless gang of sadistic paedophiles intent on abusing children on a scale that was to shock the nation. This wolf pack showed no remorse, as it brought terror, human depravity and death to three young boys in a perfect storm of such cruelty that few at the time could believe was possible. Gangs of paedophiles, and particularly sadistic paedophiles, are extremely rare. What motivates them is sexual erotic fantasies, which tend to be fixated in childhood. This gang were probably on a feeding frenzy. They would all be motivated, they would all get more and more highly excited, highly eroticized at the injury they were inflicting. Once that had started, the end result of death was inevitable. In the early summer of 1985, an errant teenager was busy having adventures in the West End. He was Jason Swift, the 14-year-old son of Sidney Swift and Joan Nurcom. Jason had been born in Nuneaton, Warwickshire, and now lived on a housing estate in Hackney, in London's East End. His family life was complicated, in and out of homes, spending much of his time absconding from school, drifting around the capital. There were four other children in the family. His younger brother, Brian, takes up the story. We had a very happy childhood. Yes, we were in homes. Um, you know, life was difficult growing up on a council estate. Um, my mum was a single mother, but I don't class my child as, un as unhappy. Jason was 13 and I would have been 12. We were, you could say, inseparable because due to our um, growing up together um, in the same home together, um, same foster home together, and then being going back to live with my mum together, um, I think it was when he was about 13 that he started to do more his own thing. Jason went to a special school, um, Horizon in Hackney, and they gave him a free uh, Red Bus Rover at the time, they were called. Um, once he had this free red bus rover, it was like a license to explore. I think he was um, mentally younger for, for his years and didn't quite understand that being a child you couldn't actually be such a free spirit and roam, roam the streets upon your own. Jason's favourite pastime was a love of foreign coins. I'd say it was his big love. Um, he used to travel up to Charing Cross Market. Um, I went with him on one occasion to collect coins. Um, he made my mum a beautiful um, coin display that sits proudly on a mantelpiece. On the 6th of July 1985, at some point during the afternoon, Jason quietly opened a door at Haley's house and slipped out. He had done this several times before, going to friends' houses and up to the West End to play the fruit machines. He had a bus pass, which allowed him to travel all over the capital, and he did. But somehow this time was different. He took some coins in a tin, a little of his sister's cash, and significantly his most prized possession, an old Monopoly set. It never left his side. He was gone. At the beginning, when it was just around London, it, you know, it would be just um, sort of during school, school days. Um, and where he would sort of then say he was at my mum's or at my sister's, um, would then when it became a bit longer, was, would, I believe when he was travelling more with the fairgrounds. And I think it was a way of travelling for free and seeing more of the world what he wanted to do. Already in 1985 alone, more than 600 young people had gone missing throughout the country. 
The vast majority had travelled to London before they disappeared. Every other train to King's Cross and coach to Victoria deposited more kids on the capital streets. Many naturally gravitated to the West End, where the bright lights and countless amusement arcades attracted them like moths to a flame. As hunger, thirst, cold and depression set in, and as the realisation dawned that the streets in London were not paved with gold, the urgent need for instant, easy cash drove many of these youngsters along a very well-trod path. Jason was a 14-year-old boy, and like all 14-year-old boys, likes excitement. London, our capital city, is a magnet for everybody. I love London. I love coming here. It's got a buzz, it's glitzy, the glamour, it's fast-paced. Jason uh, lived in London. The school gave him a bus pass. He wasn't the only uh, young boy there to have one, but that was his ticket to get to the West End where it was all happening. In reverse, people who want to indulge in sexual activities with children, they are the hunters. They come here knowing full well they've got to hang around at the, in the West End, the bus station of Victoria, the main railway stations, and the chickens, that's the young boys and young girls, will come to them, and that's where they spend their time. And Jason uh, was a willing participant to come here. He enjoyed the buzz of the, of the big city, and then he fell foul of those that did what they did to him. Jason soon came to the notice of notorious ex-rent boy turned pimp, Lenny Smith. Smith befriended the youth, corrupting him and grooming the boy for use sexually by other men. Jason Swift was, was, was a streetwise kid as well. Um, he associated with a lot of people, some of questionable character. Lenny Smith um, was a homosexual, paedophile, and he took Jason under his wing, Sidney Cook being one person that he introduced him to. Cook was a prolific paedophile and abuser of children, and in the end it turns out a murderer. His mother Joan did not immediately alert the police, because she assumed it was another of his many escapades, and that he would soon return. He sent my mum various um, cards while he was away, just um, letting her know that he was OK. Um, he never forgot her birthday. Um, but the general feel of the card was just to say, look, mum, I'm OK. I'm just out there searching for whatever he was looking for, really. Indeed, Joan received two postcards from him, one from South End and one from Brighton, saying that he was with the fair and was going up north. But as days turned to weeks and then months, the family began to fear the worst. I think Jason, once he started travelling with the fairground, um, got more and more involved with travelling travelling around with the fairground. And I think this is where, as confirmed by the police, he was actually groomed by these evil monsters. I think the phrase rent boy um, sticks with me even to this day. Um, as far as I'm aware, rent boy means young male prostitute. And as far as I'm aware, and I think confirmed by the police, Jason never was a rent boy. But Lenny Smith was just the tip of the iceberg. And beneath the surface lurked terrible danger for Jason. Um, we always assumed he'd, he'd come back, but when he did come back, um, Half the time, you've got to remember, in 1985, we didn't have telephones in our house, we didn't have mobile phones, and there was occasions where Jason would be at my mum's or um, staying with my sister, and they lived across Hackney f from each other, so there was times where Jason was a little bit clever and used to play on that and say he was with my mum, or vice versa, say he was with my sister. However, life as Jason had now come to recognise it was moving on rapidly. He was now being subjected to systemic abuse and commercial sexual exploitation by Smith. For 
For all his young, streetwise abilities and instincts, which had so often got him out of trouble in the past, Jason had now been drawn unwittingly into something far more sinister and dangerous. From this moment on, the boy was in mortal danger. London schoolboy Jason Swift had left his Hackney home in the summer of 1985. He had survived on the streets of the West End for over six months. His perilous situation had forced him into the company of a group of evil sexual predators who had ruthlessly abused and exploited him over many months. There were several paedophilic gangs operating in London at that time, and two of them were being closely monitored by the police. Lenny Smith, who had picked up Jason off the street, worked as a pimp for one of the groups on Victoria Station, itself well known as a popular hunting ground for predatory paedophiles. A large gang of such criminals had worked out of a safe house located close to the station. The police nicknamed it the Dirty Dozen. Its main base was actually in Croydon. Lenny Smith supplied the boys at five pounds per child. Jason was added to the Dirty Dozen's list. And from that point, his fate was sealed. The Dirty Dozen gang was led by Sidney Cook, a 58-year-old itinerant fairground worker. He would travel around the country luring vulnerable children with promises of free rides before he went about abusing them, often over extended periods of time. He and the other gang members would often exchange children as they used and then tired of them in their brutal desires. Cook arranged with Smith to meet and collect his latest chicken at Croydon Station. It was the meeting which was to seal Jason's fate, and it seems likely thereafter that Cook kept the boy with him as he travelled around the country for a few months. These children, in many cases, were a commodity. So when uh, dirty man A is finished with the, the young boy he's got, he would trade him on or pass him on to somebody else. They were moved around. It is awful, awful, absolutely gut-wrenchingly awful how these young kids are dealt with. Cook's influence over the other members of the wolf pack was immense. All were evil and all different characters. Sidney Cook was the leader of the gang, although small in size, wiry man, very strong uh, and possessed a great temper. If he didn't get his own way, everybody would know about it. A very, very nasty, evil person and he was the controlling influence of uh, the other three. Robert Oliver didn't get off to a good start in life uh, from birth until school age. He was dressed as a little girl by his mother and even in later life still used to put women's clothing on and answer the name of Susan. Um, Leslie Bailey, uh, again a strange man, had spent a lot of time in uh, care, child homes, um, looked and answered to the nickname of Cat Weasel, the former television character. Uh, Oliver and Bailey were homosexual partners together. Uh, Stephen Barrell, completely different again, at the time of uh, Jason's death, was living with a lady, had two children, and to all intents and purposes was uh, a normal heterosexual man. The pack had developed strategies for communicating with one another across the country. There were secret locations that kept lists of contact numbers and locations of safe houses such as that at Victoria Station, which had not as yet been discovered by the police. 
25 years ago, uh, there were no internet facilities, none, no mobile telephones, um, but those who uh, sought to have sex with young children and do the most wicked and horrible things to them had a means of communicating. They could talk to one another. They had their own underground network, as it were. Obviously, the contact was by telephone, uh, and we would be looking for the out-of-the-way telephone box, not the big telephones uh, in the shopping centres or anything like that. It's the back of the railway station, a lonely lane, a street corner. Uh, communication that way, and the other way of uh, person-to-person -person direct contact was the public toilets, cottages as they are known within the uh, trade of those who deal with sex with children. By this stage, the killer pack was in full cry, carrying out carefully planned and organized crimes. Dr. Kate Painter is a leading criminologist at Cambridge University. Certainly gangs or wolf packs of sadistic paedophiles are rare. Paedophiles tend to be isolated, they work alone, um, and they tend to be introverted. What motivates them is sexual erotic fantasies which tend to be fixated in childhood. So there does seem to be some familial intergenerational passing on of these offences. At around 5 p.m. on November the 29th, 1985, the four wolves, led by Sidney Cook, assembled in a tiny, filthy flat on the Kingsmead estate in Hackney, East London, owned by Uncle Donald Smith, an older man in his 60s, who played a significant, if more shadowy, role in the overall operations of the pack. Preparations began for that night's sadistic orgy, or party, as the gang callously called them. Each killer paid five pounds, and soft drinks spiked with drugs were prepared for Jason. The die had now been cast. The wolves had gathered. They would not have long to wait. It was now around 5.30 p.m. on that fateful Saturday night. Jason's party got underway. As the men gave full rein to their carnal and sadistic desires, a feeding frenzy overtook the wolf pack in that tiny room. These four killers would probably want to destroy Jason so powerfully to exercise absolute control and domination and inflict pain. This is also common with heterosexual rapists. The sexually motivated injuries inflicted upon Jason were appalling. He suffered lacerations and asphyxia as he was forcibly manhandled around the room and finally was strangled to death. But by first light the next morning, it was all over. Fourteen-year-old Hackney schoolboy Jason Swift had often absconded from home throughout 1984 and 1985. Now he had been missing for more than six months. He had been living rough on the streets, been befriended and sexually exploited by Lenny Smith, then taken and abused by Sidney Cook whilst working on fairs around the country. Finally, 
he had been the object of appalling sexual sadism at the hands of four evil men in a flat in Hackney on the night of the 29th of November, 1985. More than a year previously, Ramsey Smith and his fellow reporter, the late Ted Oliver, were alerted by a story coming into the newsroom of the Daily Mirror of a missing boy in Wokingham, Berkshire. Mark Tildesley was only seven years old, but had been lured away by a then unknown individual. His parents were quick to search for him as soon as they realized he was missing. But all that was found was his bicycle chained to a railing at the site of a local traveling fairground. It was a very disturbing case and uh, it was something that we thought we should uh, look at in greater detail. Roger Studley was the officer in charge of the Mark Tildesley investigation for the Met. Mark Tildesley, who lived in Wokingham in Berkshire, was a young lad who uh, was a streetwise kid and was always out on his chopper bicycle around the town and was well known to the people of the town, in fact. Um, on June the 1st, 1984, he decided to go to a fair that was being held in the town and got his mother's permission. He didn't return home, so his parents raised the alarm with the local police. A search was conducted all around Wokingham, especially the fairground. Nothing was found and no trace of Mark was discovered. But several witnesses described Mark being taken along the road by what they described as a stooping man. Uh, both myself and Ted Oliver set about compiling uh, background articles, which is the custom in those uh, cases and high profile cases. So we became very intensely involved at that stage. The, as we did so, and we spoke to a number of police officers, it became evident that we were looking at far greater story than simply the death of one child. However, the Tildesley inquiry was making very slow progress. They were no closer to finding their stooping man. After nine months, the news that the police were dreading broke. Jason's body was found in Essex. The police had by now established that Jason had been brutally raped and strangled, and that his bloodstream contained clear evidence of the drug diazepam, a very strong Valium-based tranquilizer and muscle relaxant. Detective David Bright was at that time part of Essex Police, which had joined in a three police force inquiry with Thames Valley and the Met. The murders hit the headlines and remained in the headlines for months and months and months. It was a very, very high profile investigation and it became a linked investigation. By that, that's two or more forces were working together uh, to achieve the joint end, the arrest of those responsible and subsequent charging. Yet the police still had no idea who the second victim was. They received a lucky break when, after an evening news item about the murder, they received a phone call from a girl saying that her brother had been missing for over six months and that she was worried to see the murder story. Her stepbrother, Stephen Nurcombe, was asked to identify formally the dead boy. And the police now had a name, Jason Swift. The fact of the matter was that clearly the discovery of a child's body was a major news event in itself. And very quickly after that, it became apparent that uh, Jason had been subjected to a terrible uh, ordeal and indeed uh, death. And uh, there were some very disturbing factors around uh, his killing. It was covered widely, but at that stage, no one knew the extent of the gravity of the crimes or the enormity of the um, crimes being perpetrated by the gang. The sense of outrage from the editor of the Daily Mirror at the time, Richard Stott, and indeed amongst police officers, both in the Metropolitan and Essex Police, was such that they wanted the full details of this story to be written. Three days after Jason's body was discovered, 
and 16 months after the disappearance of Mark Tildesley, the body of six-year-old Barry Lewis from Walworth in South London was found in a shallow grave, less than a mile away from Jason's grave. The police now had three child murders on their hands and still no clear results. Young Barry Lewis was a young lad of about seven or eight who wasn't a streetwise kid and he wasn't, um, didn't fit the pattern of the others. He was very afraid to be out on the streets and uh, would only be out for a very short space of time before he wanted to come home. So he was abducted within a very short time scale and he certainly didn't fit the pattern of Jason or Mark. Had the police forces had the luxury of modern day forensics and DNA testing, it might have been a different story. Alison Fendley is a senior forensic scientist and explains what modern forensic science can now do to help provide police with new evidence. The most significant advance in forensic evidence in the last 20 years has got to be the advent of DNA profiling. I mean, it was just about on the horizon 20 years ago, but it's come a long way since then. Um, you know, in those days, to get a DNA profile, we needed maybe enough blood about the size of a 10 pence, 50 pence piece, and it could take many, many weeks to develop a DNA profile. These days, we can get a profile from a few cells that aren't even visible, and we can get a profile within six hours. Um, we can um, obtain DNA from a surface that's just been touched, perhaps. But we know from experiments that we've done that some individuals are what we call good shedders of DNA and others poor shedders of DNA. So a good shedder of DNA who had just picked up a glass momentarily and, and sat it down again would have left plenty of DNA behind. And all we would need to do is swab that surface and extract the DNA found on that swab to get a profile. Alison explains the current procedures for examining a body discovered in the ground. Depending on the state of the body, really, um, and how long it's been there, obviously, you know, or if it's been very cold, it could have been preserved quite well. So um, there would be a normal examination um, in, the, in the orifices for any body fluids that might have been left behind if the body was in that state. You know. So if we were thinking the child had been abducted, kidnapped for sexual purposes, perhaps, then we'd be checking, looking for any presence of semen. But depending on how long it's been there and the amount of contact between that, that um, body and anyone that might have been handling it, we might still um, may be able to recover DNA from the surface of the skin, swabbed from the surface. However, detectives back in the day had their own tried and tested methods of getting into the minds of the criminal perpetrators. Any detective, and particularly if you're in charge of the investigation, you need to spend time at the scene of the crime. In the trade, it's known as the golden hour. It doesn't have to be 60 minutes. It could be 10, 15, 20 minutes. It could be three or four hours. The object is to put your mind or yourself into the mind of those responsible and try and plan and get the thought process of what they plan to do. The first, what I would deem to be a golden nugget, golden moment, was within a few days of uh, Jason's body being discovered uh, when um, a very alert mother took down the index number of a Jaguar car, which was owned by Sidney Cook, and he tried to entice a 13-year-old boy into his car. Uh, that, in due course, allowed us to put Cook with that car, uh, which was used to transfer Jason's body after his death. Pressure on the police to crack the case was enormous, fueled in part by a press campaign led by the Daily Mirror. Initially, there was outrage at the death of a child, quite understandably so, and it was widely covered uh, by the press throughout the UK. It became evident that there was a true web of evil in existence here. Uh, child murders had been committed. Not all the perpetrators were being brought to account. In the words of one police officer, people were getting away with murder. The inquiry team were equally astounded that a number of men could act in concert in the way that they apparently did. And as was demonstrated by their inquiries, they still believed that solitary paedophiles was the norm. And it was only by gathering information on the other gangs that the realisation gradually set in that there were other people who could do it in company with other men. 
the police made good use of, of the press in trying to uh, solve the Jason Swift killing and indeed subsequent uh, murders. The fact is that they tried to put pressure on suspects by making public certain elements of the case and to cause alarm amongst the quite large group of people who were somehow involved. The police now believed they had a clear understanding of what happened, but no real evidence. The only option was to interview the suspects over an extended period of time, waiting for an incriminating revelation from one of the suspects. My investigation was hampered by the lack of actual evidence. We had plenty of information which we gleaned over a number of weeks and months, but we had to move the inquiry on to gain some evidence with which we could charge people. We first of all brought in Leslie Bailey, who was deemed to be a vulnerable per person with special educational needs, and so he was interviewed in the presence of a Salvation Army officer, which was to ensure fairness. A lot of the time, uh, the, inf the interviews were non-productive because he would repeat a lot of things that we put to him, which wasn't evidential. But we then married the evidence he was giving us with other evidence we had, and so we enlarged the number of people we were interviewing. Uh, we interviewed people like Donald Smith, who'd featured in the Jason Swift inquiry to start with, um, and other people we felt would give us evidence. And gradually, and very gradually in fact, we started to get evidence, and eventually we had sufficient to charge Brady. the police were at last beginning to close in on the gang. Bob Brown from the Met was questioning Robert Oliver. He was still refusing to cooperate, safe in the knowledge that the evidence against him at the time was purely circumstantial. Meanwhile, David Bright of Essex Police is not making much headway with the third major suspect, Stephen Barrell. Barrell is denying all charges and stalling for more time. Brown badly needed a break and decided to play a wild card. Another Hackney-based paedophile gang led by a man named Alan Brent had just been busted by the Met. Brown was convinced some of these men would have known Oliver, Bailey and the others. During the extensive interrogation of members of the Brent gang, the name of a 21-year-old professional rent boy who also lived in Hackney, kept cropping up. The police called him Paul. He had left the area very suddenly. Brown tracked him down to Edinburgh. Following six days of coaxing and gentle questioning, Paul admitted that Oliver had abused him and his younger brother for years. And he remembered meeting a 14-year-old boy called Jason several times in Oliver's flat and around other homosexual haunts in Hackney. When shown a photo of Swift, Paul immediately identified it. At this point, another 16-year-old boy also made serious allegations against Oliver. The wild card had proved to be an ace. Another lucky break was through Barrel's common-law wife, Janet Fitzsimmons. She had been deeply traumatized by the sight of her blood-stained partner returning home in the early hours after he had participated in the Ashmead orgy. After a little time, she found the courage to shop him to the police. Finally, the ringleader, Sidney Cook. He was now serving time in Brixton prison for previous offences to other children. David Bright had permission to interview Cook over an extended period of time. After a while, the tone of the interview significantly changed. Sidney Cook's previous denials seemed to evaporate. Bright listened as Cook told the story of how the gang held Jason down. 
Bright was interrupted by a knock at the door. This indicated the interview time was over. However, the prison guard present in the room realized they were onto an important turning point in the investigation, and so blocked the door, keeping his own colleagues out to allow the interview to continue. Cook explained at length and in explicit terms what they did to the child. And finally, where they had disposed of Jason's body. They had a full confession. Almost two years later, as the pack of killers prepared to enter the Old Bailey dock, the agonizing twists and turns which had defined the whole police investigation persisted. And family, friends and police were about to be dealt a sickening blow by officialdom. In November 1985, a lethal wolf pack of sadistic child killers had brutally gang-raped and killed London teenager Jason Swift. The boy's body had been driven from Hackney to a remote farmland in Essex and buried in a shallow grave. Two other young boys had also been killed in an equally horrific manner. Following a major nationwide investigation involving three police forces, Jason Swift's killers had all now been arrested. However, at this stage, conflicting legal opinion gained currency and for a time threatened to undo all the hard work carried out by the police. Firstly, the Crown Prosecution Service accepted the defendant's plea of manslaughter as opposed to that of murder. I had no dealings myself with the Crown Prosecution Service. That was a task for officers more senior than myself. When each of the four defendants were arrested, they were subsequently charged with the offence of murder. In due course, uh, the charge was uh, referred down and they be charged with manslaughter. My own personal belief and that of the officers on the ground, as it were, for want of a description, that uh, murder should have remained the charge and it is for a judge and a jury to decide. Across the British press, there were contrasting reporting approaches towards both the crimes and the lifestyles of even the victims involved. There was much condemnation of both Jason's lifestyle and that of his family. Maybe they were partly to blame too. I think the way the British press, and this is the nationals and the locals, the way they apportioned blame to my mother was truly disgusting. This poor woman, um, I can tell you now, never left her children alone. Uh, myself and Jason was always left with a babysitter or my older sister on the one night a week that my mum went out, which was a Friday night, and we actually quite enjoyed that because we'd get crisps and sweets and we were allowed to actually stay up that little bit later. I think you have to realise back in 1985 they wanted to sell newspapers just as they do today, but they didn't take the family's con feelings into consideration. Not only had my mother lost her son in the barbaric way she had, they then decided that because she was a single mum, living on a council estate, bringing her five children up on her own, that she, in some way, was to blame for what they did. Joan Swift and members of her family attended every single day of the harrowing trial. The effects on the family can only be imagined. I think I speak for my whole family when I say that grief never goes away because it's an ongoing thing, it's the world we live in, you're constantly reminded. I could be sitting somewhere and just reading the newspaper, turning the page and there's Jason's face. So I think grief in terms of closure, I don't think I'll have a full closure. And I think grief as in dealing with it the best we can. And then, as the case reached its conclusion. Members of the jury, 
You may well find the acts of this case Bailey distressing. I saw Jason the killing a of a 14 year old. And they said they'd been to Kingsmead. Homosexual orgy. It'd been a party. Lenny would have had two or three and it boys. It was the most horrific the case I've ever Captain had to deal with. Jason had run away time. from his yeah. sister Hayden. My lord, he was a boy. May the jury visit the site where the body was discovered. Jason had become easy Guilty or not guilty? Guilty, my lord. Stand up. Sidney Cook, you will go to prison for 19 years. Leslie Bailey, you will go to prison for 15 years. Robert Oliver, you will go to prison for 15 years. Stephen Barrell, you will go to prison for 13 and a half years. Take them down. On the 12th of May, 1989, the defendants were all found guilty of manslaughter. But the Swift family and the police were to be deeply upset when later in 1989, the sentence on Sidney Cook was reduced by three years on the basis that his lawyers argued he was not the actual ringleader of the Dirty Dozen or even the ringleader of the group that killed Jason. During the trial of uh, Leslie Bailey, when he admitted the killing of Barry Lewis, um, it was contended then by Sidney Cook's defence barrister that Bailey had described himself by admitting the killing as being the ringleader of the gang, which was clearly untrue. Sidney Cook, without doubt, was the leader of the gang. And when the contention was placed before the court, there was no objection to it from the Crown Prosecution Service, which was astounding. They knew the evidence as well as I did, and the whole team, the whole team were amazed that it was not questioned. And the fact that Sidney Cook received a reduction in his sentence as a result of one man being honourable enough to admit his part in the crime was something that we will never forgive. However, the press was not to forgive or forget his atrocities that easily. The Mirror, amongst others, were convinced his true nature should never be forgotten. I think it's fair to say that the role played by myself, Ted Oliver and the Daily Mirror in this tragic episode was to expose the full extent uh, of the web of evil that was in existence at the time. These were shocking, disturbing child murders that perhaps otherwise would not have been afforded the same notoriety as previous child murders had been given. And I think that that is how I would regard the Daily Mirror's contribution to this case. It has always been with us and methods to try and deal with it have not been successful. I think we could get more of a grip on what could be done about convicted paedophiles. The ones that actually come to the attention of the criminal justice system. Arguably, the therapies have not been robust enough, tried enough, but their therapy is costly and paedophiles are not really very well regarded by anybody and the prison service is not really going to put enormous resources but maybe that's what we should be doing. So what has now become of the Dirty Dozen gang? I don't say this lightly, but I say it truly when I say in a perverse way, we are the lucky ones. And I mean that in the sense that we know where Jason is, we visit his grave, 
we take flowers there. I can't imagine for the life of me the pain that poor Mark Tilsley's mum, for instance, must go through to this day when she doesn't know where her little boy is. Knowing where Jason is kind of gives you some aspect of closure. And you know, you deal with your pain and you go to the cemetery and you visit him and you talk to him and you tell him about your day, about your life and what's going on. So in that respect, I, you know, there is some sort of closure. And again, going back to not knowing where Jason, or not knowing where Jason is, if I didn't know where he was, I wouldn't have that. Um, so for me, that's a massive part of, of, of actually dealing with our grief as a family, is that we know where our poor boy is. British Crime Month continues tomorrow night at 8 with the Hungerford Massacre. Next, the detectives have no body, but they do have a report of a brutal beating in Crime 360.